Hello? Hi. Hey, welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here for this talk. And I know it's the last day of the summit. It's a Friday. So you must be some hardcore stackers, right? And that too about neutron hybrid mode. Anyway, so let me give a little brief introduction about the talk. So the, uh, as you, a lot of you have seen, a bunch of PayPalers give talk about how we've been deploying OpenStack in PayPal for like more than a year. So we've been running into a lot of unique use cases and that we wanted to share with you. One of them was we wanted to run overlays and bridged mode VMs on the same hypervisor. So it was a little bit of a challenge. Traditionally, people run either overlay or bridged and run them as separate networks, but we wanted to combine both of them. And I'll, I'll share those experiences with you. And then towards the end, I have some performance numbers that I'm going to show uh, with, for bridged bare metal and uh, tunnel VMs and see. And you know, I'm, these tests were done with a lot of background traffic, but you know, we can perhaps get some um, takeaways from that. So you already know about PayPal. I'm not going to go through this slide, but this basically tells uh, the only point I wanted to men mention was the 137 million active users. That's active, so we have a lot of registered users, which is much higher than that. So the, the structure of the presentation is set up uh, such that, you know, I'm just going to give a little brief introduction to the data center architecture that most of you might already know. And then a little details about Neutron basics, and I think by now most of us know what Neutron is capable of doing, so I'm just going to briefly touch on the basics. And then a little introduction about overlays and physical networks. And then the use cases that led us to this hybrid solution. And I'm going to show you some performance data that I ran in our live data center with tunnel VMs, bridged VMs, and bare metal. And uh, maybe we can <clears throat> do some analysis of that. And then if you have enough time, we can go through a quick Q&A. So this is our uh, standard data center architecture, right? I mean, this is no different. Most companies do that. This is not a representation of what we do at PayPal, but it's to the scale. It's like a miniature scale. This is how it looks like. So we have a core layer. <clears throat> we have an aggregation layer. And we have an access layer. What we mean by access, that's our top of the rack switches. So racks, which have hypervisors or compute nodes, are connected through the access. And we usually double, dual connect them for redundancy purposes. But the new data center architecture looks like this, with V switches and OpenStack. So what it does is, in addition to the access layer, which, which is the TOR layer, the, the top of the rack layer, below that, we have a bunch of V switches now. These are switches which are sitting on a hypervisor. So if, if you just do a simple math, at least from our data center point of view, we have a 50 to 1 ratio. For every one physical switch, we have 50 hype, uh, virtual switches. This is like in a, if you're running in a non-redundant mode. If you run in a redundant mode, we have like 25 virtual switches to a single physical switch. That's a lot. So what it does, what it tells me is that I have this intelligent edge switches sitting in my hypervisors, right? We can do a lot of great things. We can do distributed firewalls. We can do security groups. We can do ACLs. We can do tunnels and all kinds of stuff. So I, I want to focus on that. So if I look at the same picture from a different viewpoint, again, the top layer is the, the top of the rack switch. And then you see all the hypervisors connected. And you see the V switches on them. And you have all the VMs uh, running on them. So the VMs connect through bridged or overlay mode, whatever, whatever uh, overlay, uh, the networking format that you use to connect your VMs. And they can also connect across VMs <clears throat> different racks using the top of the rack switch. So this is a neutron basic diagram. I apologize. I realized I didn't have time to change it. This is an old slide because it says quantum. <laughs> it's neutron, so I apologize. This is, but the, basically, the, the, the various components of OpenStack are still intact. It's just that we have Celometer and Cinder and all that stuff, which we don't see here. So the basic, the way uh, Neutron gets orchestrated in op OpenStack and how it interacts with Keystone and Nova is all shown here. So, so let me talk about overlay networks, right? I mean, most of you already know, but I just want to go through that so that we set the stage for the problem that we're trying to solve with PayPal. So overlays provide connectivity between VMs and network devices using tunnels. And the cool thing about this is the physical 
infrastructure, which is my <coughs> network switches, routers, they don't need to be provisioned because as we saw in the picture about the virtual switches, the intelligence is in the V switches, right? So the, the top, my top of the rack and uh, um, core routers end up being more or less be dumb and provide layer three connectivity with ECMP. So yeah, as I said, the tunneling end cap, D cap is done at the virtual switch, the edge layer as we like to call it. <clears throat> and it also helps us in the tunneling mode the tenant's network address is decoupled from the provider space, right? So that it allows me, as a result of that, I can have overlapping addresses. So there is a use case for us where we want to support that in PayPal. Uh, so today, the, there are a lot of tunneling protocols that you can use. The ones that are in vogue these days are VXLAN, STT, and NVGRE. So my talk is going to focus mostly on OVS and just to set the stage, we use Nicera for our plugin, for STN controller. Uh, so the results that I did are mostly with STT, but I want to try it out. Now that we got ML2 plugin that Kyle and Bob talked about this morning, that will help us you know, try it with various tunneling techniques. <clears throat> the physical networks, also called as provider networks, right? These allow you to connect VMs and network devices using provider networks. and I like to use the term first-class first citizens. The VMs sit on the hypervisor, so they are on par. What I mean by a first-class citizen is the IP address of the VM is at the same level as the, the hypervisor. There is no tunneling here. The only thing that might happen is you might insert a shim layer like VLAN. So at the IP layer, they're sharing the same address space. So there are no tunneling protocols excepting for the uh, VLANs. And a lot of times, the tenant separation is achieved by using VLANs, or if you don't want to use VLANs, by using IP subnet, but that gets complicated really quick. Uh, what we found out was using provider uh, networks or physical networks, it is hard for us to create isolation. You can do isolations using VLANs, then you have to run VRFs and all kinds of stuff, and then you need to configure your routers, and you need to create all these domains. When you start doing that, then you're putting complexity back into the network. The whole point was to take it away from the network and put it in the edges, right? So it's, it's hard to do overlapping addresses with VLANs. But some people have tried it, and they can make it work. But you know, we didn't want to go down that path. Uh, and also, one of the limitations, or at least from our point of view, we find it to be a, which causes friction with, within our organization, is when we use VLANs, it's not just edge switches. Now I've got to go configure my top of the rack switches, my core switches with VLANs. So usually the cloud team is different from the network security team. So we need to open a ticket, and there's a SLA for that. So it kind of it takes away from agility, right? So I just wanted to show how our networks look like. So we run both overlay and physical on the same cloud infrastructure. So what we do is we have a bunch of racks, which are our hypervisors, and on the left-hand side, uh, you see the tenant, which was on a physical network, and a tenant on an overlay network. So the, the tenant on the physical network directly plumbs through the top of the rack switches into the hypervisor's V switches, right? V switches, the only thing they might end up doing is insert a VLAN. Or if you're using flat mode, not even that. In the case on the right-hand side, where we have a tenant on an overlay network, so they go through our virtualization layer, and the, virtual, the virtualization layer is the intelligence is, exists on the vSwitches, and that provides the tunneling. So this is kind of, I want to spend a few minutes on this slide. So this slide is talking about the pros and cons of the various techniques, right? So I just wanted to, on the, the top row, you see the, I'm comparing pros and cons of running a pure hypervisor. You don't do any VMs versus VMs which are running in bridged mode. When I say bridged mode, it's using either flat network or VLAN. And then tunnel VMs, in our case, STT tunnels, and the VMs running on that. So what we found out was, if you, if you look at the, the various features, if you do the pros and cons, the throughput-wise, the hypervisors tend to be best, right? Because they're running bare metal, there's no hypervisors involved, packet go hit the NIC card, and they go out. And the bridged VLANs, in a scale of worse, better, and best, they're, they, they're somewhere in the middle. And the tunnel VMs are supposed to kind of have the worst performance. 
And the reason I highlight that row is because in the results that I show, you get slightly different results. And that's the reason I just wanted you to focus on. So we'll, when we get to the slide, we'll, we'll take a look at it. And the latency-wise, if you look at latency for a packet to go from a bare metal hypervisor to another bare metal, you get the best performance. And it degrades when you go to the tunnel VMs. Now, when you talk about flexibility, right? We need flexibility. For example, uh, I need to don't have to touch my physical uh, routers and switches to make something happen, reconfigure my network. So that is best achieved if you use tunneling VMs, right? With bridge v VLANs, you can do that, but it's like, again, as I gave you the example of the VLANs, right? I need to still go configure that. Now, with hypervisors, you don't get much flexibility, like running it on bare metal. Now, if, if you want to support overlapping IP addresses, the best solution is to use tunneling protocols. You can do that with bridged VLAN, but again, as I mentioned, you don't want to run into situations where you're doing VRFs and things like that, and it gets putting complexity back in the network. And then the operational dependency, this is what I mean by our organization, which, is, which I'm part of a cloud team, has dependencies with our networking team, right? So that's what I mean by organizational dependence. Sometimes some organizations have figured it out how to make it work. Some haven't, because we've been around in this business for a long time, so there are silos in our organization, so things work through tickets, so, and that also causes, so that's what I mean by operational dependency. So if I use tunnel VMs, I have the least amount of uh, dependency with other silos, siloed organizations in our company. So, given, now that we have gone through the introduction of the overlays and tenants, so let me talk about our use cases. So we, we run OpenStack in different environments. The first environment I want to talk about is a production environment. So production is, is what serves our PayPal website. So we have a web tier, a mid tier, data tier, all that stuff, right? So <clears throat> it runs across multiple data centers, and our requirements are to have a low latency, high throughput. I mean, who can say no to that, right? So we decided we're going to go with bridge mode, because if you look at the slides where, where I did the pros and cons, bridge mode tends to have the highest throughput and low latency. Then we have a, another production, another environment called M&A, mergers and acquisition. You know, PayPal has been in this business for a long time. We acquire companies, small, big, large, and some of them run their own private clouds or run in Amazon or Rackspace. We are, since we are building our own cloud, we would like to bring them back into our cloud. The reason is so that we can take advantage of our NOC monitoring tools and uh, avail of the redundancy and availability zones that we have with all our data centers, right? So we run that cloud too, that's called MNA cloud. So here, we might have to support overlapping IP addresses, right? Because when we buy a company, we ask them to come in, we, we can't tell them to go renumber your IP addresses. So we should have the ability to support that. So that is very paramount, that's, that becomes very high priority for us to support. But again, they also have the same need. They would like to have low latency and high throughput. But these are like, you know, so, with these requirements, we decided we were going to go with an overlay mode because overlapping IP addresses and flexibility is very of paramount importance to us. Then we have the third environment, the dev QA environment. This is where our PayPal production team, sorry, product development team, go. They, they all have an account. They log in, spin up their VMs, write their code, test it, and they have these QA environments and stage environments they run it. So it turned out we ran into an issue here. We thought we were going to run it all using uh, overlay mode. But we, in a QA mode, we felt that because of some constraints that we had, we had to run them in a bridged mode, meaning fixed IP, floating IP didn't work for us. So, but the developers were going to run an overlay mode, but the QA was going to run in a bridged mode. So this is where we came up with this concept of how do we run both bridged and overlay mode in the same uh, OpenStack cloud. So this was our use cases. Now, the problem statement, right? We want to support flexibility. We want to have low latency, high throughput, all this usual stuff, right? No one says no to that. And we also want to support both bridged and overlay. And the VMs that get spun up on hypervisor should have the freedom to pick, oh, I'm going to be on an overlay network or a bridge network. You don't want to restrict that. Uh, and we need to have a consistent deployment pattern. What I mean by that is we use Puppet for configuring all our uh, hypervisors. So 
imagine if I had an overlay mode for my m and cloud, bridge mode for my production cloud, then, you know, then I'm, I'm doing one-offs. Then it becomes like, you know, my deployment pattern is not consistent. So if I have a mechanism where I can configure my OBS switch or vSwitch so that it can support both, then we can deploy that. And if you want to use the bridge mode, use it. If you don't want to use it, use the overlay mode, fine. It, there's no penalty. There's no overhead. Right? So I want to spend a few minutes on this slide because this is the key to what we did. So this is how a hypervisor, the whole, the outline, the big rectangle that you see, that's our hypervisor, right? And it has, it has a management interface on the left-hand side. That's where we run our OpenStack API, in-band, and out-of-band management. On the right-hand side, you see two copper ports, which are 10-gig ports, and we usually bond them in active standby. And this is where our production traffic goes through. Our management traffic and production traffic are in different interfaces. So we bond them, like you know, using Ethernet bonding, active standby. And we all know BRint, the integration bridge that gets created by OpenStack, and all the VMs land on that, right? And the IP address for the production interface is configured on the bond interface. And the management has its own IP address, but you know, we're not interested in that because none of the tunnel traffic or the bridge traffic ever goes through the management traffic, uh, management interface. So along come two tenants, VM belonging to tenant A, VM belonging to tenant B. They both have requirement that they have overlapping IP addresses. They don't want to share. I mean, they're overlapping, but they want to have isolation. So in a typical environment, what happens is they land on the BR int, and then we have a tunnel uh, bridge. Well, I'm, use, I'm taking some artistic liberties here, right? If you look at the STT model, it, it has ports for each of the hypervisors, but I'm gonna try to encapsulate that as like, you know, it's a separate tunneling bridge. So, so the traffic comes in, the two VMs traffic, you know, the BR end uses some kind of a VLAN to do separation of these uh, two tenants, and the traffic goes down to the BR tunnel. And this tunneling bridge, and there's a dotted line, right? All the BR tunnel does is, it says, based on the VM's traffic, Looking at the ID, it figures out uh, which destination hypervisor is supposed to go, and then puts an end cap and sends it out using the source IP address of the, the bond interface. This is how it works. This is the standard stuff. This is how OpenStack and Neutron work for overlays. Then I have a situation. Now I got a third tenant coming along, and he is on tenant C, and he does not want to use. Um, Overlays. He wants to use bridged, and he's on VLAN 200. So what we decided was to solve this, and, there, and he's on the same hypervisor, right? So what we decided was we created another bridge. What we did was on the bond interface, we created a BR bond and moved the IP address from the bond interface to the BR bond. And now the BR tunnel talks to that, and the BR int has a straight plumbing into the BR bond. So with this, by adding that BR bond, extra bond, we were able to configure this so that we can, I mean, this is not very complicated, this is fairly straightforward. People who have been playing around with Neutron have done that, but this is you know, real use case that we're using today. So that's how we did it. So I'm happy to pause here for a couple of minutes if someone wants to ask any questions. We can spend some time here now because by the time I go to the end of the slides. <laughs> so if any questions? Could you say that again? Uh-huh. Oh, okay. The question was, for making changes to enable this, did we have to make any changes to the neutron code? No. It's all config configuration. So. so we did not do anything complicated. We just played around with OpenB switches. We know what it's capable of doing. And then we had a vendor, helpful vendor, who was working with us, and we figured out how to do that. All right? So that's how the bridge traffic goes through. Now, there are a couple of slides which goes into a lot of details about how we did the configuration. I'm just going to walk through them, and you know, if, if, you get, uh, if it gets too much, you know, just bear with me for a couple of minutes. So what we got to do is when you create a flat network, 
you create the network. So if you see the first uh, command is using Neutron, we create the uh, bridge network. And you specify, you know, it's a flat network and provide the phys network, you know, the physical network. And then you create a subnet and then you specify your gateway and if you want DSCP and all this. This is a standard Neutron commands, right? If you want to use a VLAN command, you do something similar. You use provide the physical network, the FizNet ID, and the segmentation ID, and specify what VLANs are part of this uh, network. And then you know you create, create your sub VLAN subnet. Now, okay, animation is off here. So, uh, now when you want to create an overlay network, so in our uh, Neutron um, configuration, the default mode is to use overlays. If you do not specify, it's going to pick an IP address in the overlay network. So unless you f f tell when you boot up the VM, when you spin up the VM, you need to tell, no, I don't want it to be an overlay. I want it to be on the bridge. So this is how you do the overlay network. On the compute node, we have to do a little bit of, these are all the commands that I'm just showing. And by the way, I'm going to put this all slides up. Uh, put it up on the, it's still not on the site yet. I'm going to do it right after the talk. So you, if you want to take pictures, that's fine, but you'll get the slides too. Um, so what we did was we added the BR bound zero, and we configured the OBS. And you, these are all the commands that you, if, I don't know if anyone has attended Justin's talk on OBS, the deep dive yesterday. It's pretty cool. I think you know, OBS is like, you know, as I said, in the survey that 48% of the people are using OBS, right? And we happen to be one of those. Uh, so you, you s use all these commands, and it has a lot of cool tools for you to look at the flows, inspect flows, and things like that. So these are all the commands that you need to run on the compute node to enable the, the setup that I showed in the picture, right? So now that we got the hybrid mode out of the way, now we wanted to validate to see, okay, we made all this assumption saying that, oh, my bare metal is gonna have the best throughput, lowest latency, my tunnel VMs are gonna have the worst performance. No, we made all this assumptions, but we need to validate that. So we said, okay, let's run some tests. So luckily, the data center was just getting built up. This was like in the early, in the second quarter of this year. Uh, not, the data center was already built. We were building up this cloud. We had all these racks there. So we said, let's measure. So I, I was looking for two metrics, throughput and latency. So what I did was I came up with like three scenarios. Run, test within a rack, because within a rack, we run a layer three, so hypervisor to hypervisor communication is a layer two, meaning it's a, there's no layer three hop. It goes to the top of the rack switch, comes back, so it's a layer two switching. Uh, we wanted to run throughput and latency between bare metal to bare metal, bridge to VM to bridge to VM, and a tunnel VM to tunnel VM, tunnel being uh, SGT tunnels here in this case. And the second test I wanted to do was across racks. And across racks, the reason I wanted to use across racks was now it's going through the distribution layer and taking a layer three hop, right? So a lot of east-west traffic, when VMs want to talk to other VMs, if they don't happen to be in the same uh, rack, they go through this layer three hop. The same three combinations, bare metal to bare metal, bridge VM to bridge VM, and tunnel VM to tunnel VM. And the third thing was since, remember, we have an overlay network, right? So if I'm deploying an overlay network, I want to, I also have a layer three gateway somewhere, which is my gateway between my virtual cloud to the physical cloud. So we wanted to run some tests there. So bare metal to bare metal. So the, the thing about bare metal to bare metal, it doesn't go through the layer three gateway, right? It's, a, it's not really a fair comparison, right? And then bridge VM to bare metal, again, it doesn't go through the layer three gateway, but I just wanted to see what are the results for these. And then tunnel VM to bare metal, this one happens to go through the layer three gateway. And the reason we wanted to do was, if I did, if I deployed everything using layer three, I have to go through layer three gateway. And if I did not, then I don't have to go through the layer three, but what are the throughput issues and latency? But this test, I ran into a lot of issues. So even though I got some data, I'm not gonna present it because I wanna be honest, right? I'm not trying to put anybody down. So we have a vendor that we're working with. So, uh, I'm gonna go back and try running this test again. So if anybody, anybody is interested in working with me on this, you're more than happy, I'm more than happy to collaborate with you. 
send me an email, and you know we can sort this thing out. Uh, so a description of our setup. So we have a computer hypervisors. They're HPs. I think they've got ProLand, uh, SL230, 260. And th these are like massive servers, right? They have 16 cores running at 2.6, Sandy Bridge, have two 10 gig uh, NICs, Intel based NICs, PCIe, it has 256 RAMs. And we have 96 rows in each rack. And we run all our hypervisors today in uh, PayPal run RHEL 6.4. That's what has been approved because we are a PCI company for payment cards industry and specifications. So there are some hypervisors which are approved. So RHEL 6.4 is approved and that's what we use. And the VMs that I use to do the testing, I use the same consistent VM. This VM had two virtual cores. It had eight gigs of RAM and it, it was running RHEL 6.4. So this is how our test, look up, test setup looked like. Uh, I had two firewalls. I mean, this is, we have firewalls everywhere in PayPal. You, know, you can't turn any direction without hitting a firewall. So, so there are firewalls there, and then there's the load balancers, and then the core, the core uh, routers, and, and, and the, uh, the distribution layer sw uh, switches. So I'm not showing the top of the rack switches here. They're assumed they're part of the rack. So, we have, they're all, each rack connects to two different, different distribution switches. This was a pretty small deployment that we had. And I was lucky enough, I thought, you yeah, had this setup, why don't I run some tests, right? But you'll be surprised how many problems it added to. So, uh, and so we have racks, and then we also have a separate rack on the right-hand side. If you see, it says layer three gateways for overlays. So the devices that we use for doing the layer three gateways, which go from uh, virtual to physical world, they're actually, even though they run on compute nodes, they're not really compute nodes, they're routers, right? So they need to belong, they need to go up. So we did not put them in the compute racks, you know, the cattle puppy story, right? And they, they don't need to be there, so they need to be away from that. Because these, those two compute nodes need to have fiber access. Uh, the, the 10 gig ports need to be fiber. So all our compute nodes are copper, so we didn't want to mix and match. So, so testing methodology, let me see the time check, okay. Uh, so the tunneling VM, as I said earlier, we are using OBS, uh, STT and OBS. Uh, the bridged VM uses flat network. We did not use VLAN, you know, just to keep the complexity down a little bit. And I used NTTCP 1.47 for throughput testing. The reason I used NTTCP is like it takes the disk latency out of the equation. It's just testing pure network. I did not transfer a file because then I have to read the disk. Then the disk latency plays into the equations. I don't get a clear picture of what's the latency in the network. So NTTCP just sends send like 10 million packets in both directions. And then what I did was I used only TCP testing. I didn't do UDP. And I ran buffer size, not MTU, buffer size, from 64 bytes all the way up to 60, 64K, right? And increments, you know, of powers of two, 64, 128, 256. And the MTU size on my VMs, and my hypervisors, they're all 1,500 bytes. <clears throat> and for latency measurements, I ran ping. And I collected 60 samples at a one second interval. And then within that set, we picked the min, max, and the average. So I will show those results. <clears throat> and I use Python scripts to run all the, automate all these tests. Because sending 10 million packets, all this combination takes a while. So, so Unfortunately, when I thought I was going to run this test, I was expecting the, the whole setup to be pristine. No one else is there. But it turns out the cloud is very popular in PayPal. As soon as we built it, there are like 470 VMs already there. So I'd, unfortunately, I was not able to run it in a, an ideal test situation. But I think that's fine, though, because this reflects real-world situation anyhow. So there's a lot of background traffic going on. So that might show my results maybe a little off. But you know, I figured I'd still better show the results instead of showing you pristine results, right? So we had around 100 hypervisors in this whole network, and we were deploying them in half racks, so that they were all in different, uh, we, our racks had built, broken up into half racks, so, so that we put in different uh, layer three domains. So the first setup is testing within the same rack. So we had two hypervisors, same rack. 
even though I show the arrow like they're directly talking, they're actually going through a top of the rack switch, but it's a layer three, a layer two switching, no layer three hop. So this is what we got, the testing results. I'm sorry, you couldn't see the legend at the bottom, so I'll try to fill up. So the red is for tunnel VMs, blue is for my hypervisor's bare metal, and the green is for my bridged VMs. So on the x-axis, x-axis what I have is the buffer size that I was using, 64 bytes all the way up to 65. And on the y-axis, you see the throughput. So at the top, that's the, where the, you see the green line, that's around nine gigabits per second. And this is like bi-directional, right? This is, I'm just showing the TX and you'll also see the RX. So, but let me just, uh, so if you notice, the two things that pop out from this, one of them is like for packet, for buffer sizes below my MTU size, 1500, you see this little step up and then they stabilize. Before, for buffer sizes less than 1500, I see that my tunnel VMs outperform. The, the red one, which is the tunnel VM, they outperform my bare metal, my bridged VM. So this kind of, that's the reason I, I underline my row in the pros and cons, because you would not expect that, right? So there's a reason why, we'll get into those reasons. And so the thing that I, still don't know why this happened. I see the bridged VM continues to outperform a bare metal and tunnel VM even after the MTU size is 1,500. I don't, it should not. My all knowledge I have about networking says that it should not, so I need, I need to figure out why. So I'm going to ignore that for the time being. Maybe I have to run it again. So, uh, And this is the latency. So what I did was, remember I said I was running 60 samples at a min? max and an average, right, in that sample. So the, the three clusters, the left-hand side cluster the min, the cluster on the right-hand side is the max, and the one in the middle is the average. So if you look at it, the blue ones indicate the ping latency for the bare metal. As expected, it's lowest, right, bare metal to bare metal. Then I see the tunnel VMs tend to have the highest latency. But if you look at the max on the tunnel VM, it just like goes crazy. And there's a reason for that. It's because the first time because this is, again, open, we, if you attended Justin's talk yesterday, you'll know. When you ping for the first time, the tunnel does not exist. It, has to, it gets kicked up to the user space, and it drops a flow. So you take a hit of the, for, for the first packet. So that's what that is. So ideally, if I were smart, I would drop that sample out. But, you know, at least I'm setting the context so you know what it is, right? So the average looks more reasonable now. So the analysis of this, right? So the observation, so results, as I said, for less than MTU size, the tunnel VMs running STT ten, tended to have the best performance. And the reason behind that is, you know, the, all our NICs have offload capability, like large uh, transmit, large receive offloads, and segmentation uh, offload, and checksum offload. So when you send packets less than the max MTU, what happens is open vSwitch does buffering, and it's taking advantage of, so that's the reason you perhaps you get a longer, higher latency also. So it sends out larger segments out to the NIC card, whereas the bare metal doesn't do that. It just sends it out. But once you hit the 1500 packet, the, the size, the 1500 uh, MTU, if you notice, the performance for the bare metal is same as my tunnel, because both of them are not taking advantage of the NIC. And it's because OBS is doing these little smart little things in the kernel. <clears throat> so so if, if you tend to have a lot of your traffic under the MTU size, you might see slightly higher performance because you're happening, happening to go through SCT tunnels in OBS. So I did the same test across racks. But unfortunately, I was not able to spin up the bridged VMs across these two because for whatever reason, we ran into some issues. So I was able to only compare tunnel VMs versus bare metal. The same results. I see that for MTU, for the buffer size, for the NTT, NTTP traffic, less than 1,500 bytes, you see that the tunnel VMs outperform my bare metal, right? So I'm happy to take any questions at this time before we go further.
MTU. Yeah. MTU. That's a default. What about the tunnel overhead? Well, there well, obvious what it does is it that's a that's advantage. It when you send smaller packets, it will accumulate them and it will amortize the overhead on a longer, bigger packet because it's a TCP. It can do that. No, but see, the, my TCP is using a segment size, right? Which, the buffer size is, I'm using TCP. TCP doesn't have an MTU. It's a byte, it's a stream, right? Yeah, so it's not UDP, right, okay. So I see the same performance, and I think this, again, goes back to the OBS and SGT doing their little massaging of the data on its way out to get higher throughput. Again, I see the same results. Latency for tunnel VMs tend to be a little on the high side. And again, Ignore the max thing because that's a one-off. Right. The numbers on the left. Uh, the numbers on the left. Uh, 0.5, the first uh, line is 0.5 milliseconds. And the one at the top is 3.5 milliseconds. These are all in milliseconds. I'm sorry, I should have. I thought it was going to be big, but it uh, obviously not. <laughs> so it's still fast. Okay. Yeah, it's still fast. I mean, it's not like. We're not talking hundreds or even tens of milliseconds. So my bare metal takes uh, around maybe 0.1 millisecond, and my hypervisor is taking, my tunnel VM is taking like maybe 0.25 milliseconds. I can have maybe 2x for the min, and for the average also is like maybe 3x. Right? So again, uh, analysis of this results, we had no bridge VMs because I had a test setup issue. Results for buffer size less than the MTU size. Again, the tunnel VMs tend to do, have better overall throughput. Uh, again, this is because of OBS and STT tunnel optimizations, taking advantage of the TCP offload uh, for large segments, receive and transmit and checksumming offloads. Uh, when the buffer size is increased and it's greater than the MTU size, the results kind of like in all the bare metal tunnel, they all kind of like stabilize at the same numbers. And as I said earlier, right, we have the tunnel VMs tend to have on an average higher latency, like around 2x, 3x, than a bare metal. Now, this setup, which I said earlier, where I was going to test across layer 3 gateways, I ran into Results, but I'm not going to show this thing because I want to be honest because they're off. I had trouble interpreting what those results were, and I'm trying to sort those things out. If anyone wants to collaborate with me on this, more than happy to send me an email, and I'll be happy to work with you. And we have racks and racks of compute servers, so we can do all these tests. Now with ML2, I can do it also for VXLAN and GRE and all that stuff, which will make life easier. So basic analysis, like, you know, we went through this analysis again. So I want to quickly go to conclusion of future work. Uh, basically, when you're trying to deploy, you try to understand what you need out of your network. You want low latency, high throughput, things like that, flexibility. Now, these are all like there is, you cannot get everything, right? There is a, you need to give and take some. And so based on that, you can come up with a solution. And that's what we did. And we ended up coming up with a hybrid mode. And then also, anytime, before you make an assumption saying that tunnel is going to be better or not worse, Always run your performance, verify, and run some performance tests. Uh, and make your deployment patterns simple, straight. Even if you're not using the overlay mode, put that capability in your OBS so that you, who knows, you might end up using it. And future, what I would like to do is expand my performance test across layer three networks and also do for various tunneling schemes like VXLAN, NVGRE. So right now, the way Neutron is set up today is like, you know, I have one plug-in model. I cannot change. So hopefully, uh, once we, with ML2 plugin that's coming out, I can take advantage of that and hopefully run some VMs running VXLAN, some running GRE and whatnot. So we'll see how that thing pans out. So again, as I said, if you want to collaborate, I'm more than happy to work with you guys. Send me an email. I'm happy to take any questions.